Oh, welcome to the Take Flight podcast. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you for including me. Oh, do you know what? I actually got called out for this the other day because I always say I've been so excited for this naturally because the people I speak to are, are amazing. <laughs> but I have been so, yeah. so excited for this for a long time. Um, I read your first book a while back. I was lucky enough to get the the new one here, advanced copy, which is, I felt very, very special to get the advanced copy. And it's it's just blown my mind completely. It's, um, Thank you, brother. It's unbelievable. Yeah, so congratulations on that, first of all. Yeah, it was something. Um, I wrote it mostly the rough draft while I was in the garage for a few months while the pandemic was exploding, you know, February mm-hmm. uh, 2020. And so just all that time, that isolation, that pressure just kind of uh, just came out. Now when I try to write, I'm like, wait a second, it sounds <laughs> shallow compared to what's in there. So it's an interesting thing where crisis can reveal or release creativity, you know. Mm, absolutely. Yeah, it's interesting. It's funny as well. Um, I think you find books at a time that you need them. A lot of the times anyway, not always. But with this one, it fell in in my hands just as I needed it, particularly the part about self, which I would love to dive in today into. Um, before we do that, there's a couple of other things I wanted to just mention before we start. A couple of other commonalities. So you, I don't know whether you'd know them. I don't know whether you, this was the stuff that you use as far as with your studying, but... I knew him as Uncle Alwyn, but my my great uncle was William Alwyn Lishman, the author of Organic Psychiatry. And I, again, I don't know whether you use that textbook at all in your studies, but over in the UK, it was like the biggest textbook for uh, neuroscience mm. and psychiatry. Um, so I had that from a young age, being exposed to that and learning about the mind and, and psychiatry and all that sort of stuff. And and then ten years ago, my mum had uh, uh, I, I wrote it down to get the actual term right, an astrocytoma. Mm-hmm. So that was one of the biggest traumatic events in my life was her going through that and having surgery. So is she um, okay? She is okay, thankfully. Yeah, um, it was in the frontal lobe. So some other questions I was going to ask you about around you bet. Yeah, you know, perhaps our personality changes and stuff like that. So I'm glad um, she's doing well. Not everybody mm, does. Um, yeah. Um, so that's uh, that's fantastic. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so yeah, look, Rahul, I'd love to just start with asking you about your week what a typical week looks like we've never spoke to a brain surgeon or any surgeon mm-hmm. for that matter on the podcast so what what happens you know you start on a monday morning how does the week play out for you usually well you know my week is very different than most surgeons so i'll i'll okay. first share with you what is the usual surgical practice uh and then tell you what i'm doing it's a bit different so first of all surgeons don't operate every day in medical school, when we choose between surgery and non-surgery, people think surgeons are operating every day. No, you got to have a couple of days of clinic where you see people who may benefit from an operation and where you see the people that have received an operation that you need to follow back through rehabilitation. So usually surgeons operate two days a week, have clinic two days a week. In clinic, they write prescriptions. They do all those things that physicians do. And then they go to the shop and they operate. Um, I always like that the the variety of the week uh, and then there's maybe a day where it's administrative and if you do stuff that's uh hardcore you know heart surgery trauma surgery brain surgery transplant surgery then you just you got to know that uh the nights and weekends are not yours i mean you can try to structure it to where you have people you share your practice with but if you put a liver in somebody or you do a big brain surgery on somebody and it's not and the weekend is somebody else's to cover and that person is having trouble, you want to go back in. That's your patient. That's your work. So it's not really a handoff kind of practice if you go into hardcore surgery. So people need to know that, you know, my, my path. Yeah. I I didn't engineer it, brother. I mean, it's like, uh, you know, I had dropped out of university for a while. I was working as a security guard, went to medical school, thought I was going to be a pediatrician, ended up being a surgeon um thought I was going to be a heart surgeon they fired somebody in neurosurgery and needed somebody so I jumped ship and got I was a battlefield pickup I mean it's been like that I mean it's not <laughs> it's not from a young age I wanted any of this I'm just willing to go for it and uh and then when I was in training for brain surgery um you know I, I went to the lab for a couple of years and picked up a PhD um that was interesting because then my current employer, City of Hope Cancer Center, said, you're 35, 
you're just you're fresh out the gates. You're gonna we'll make you a professor, and we'll ask you to run a lab half your week, and do cancer surgery the other half. So I said, wait a second, I got to take that shot. Um, it's a very difficult thing to be both, but I had young kids, uh, you know, three, five, seven, or eight, you know, like th that range. And many of the surgeons I know, they had, uh, you know, missed the time with their children. So I saw this as an opportunity to like have a cooler career, make a bigger impact, have more time with the kids. It was just mm -hmm. like it, it was a potential dream. And then then I've had to make it work. So right now, uh, as a as a surgeon, I would say I'm two days a week. And as a scientist, I'm three days a week. But science is in the ether. You know, you don't sit down and do science. You just talk, you just think about it all the time. The ideas, the creativity. How does a cancer cell grow? Why does it grow here? Why does it grow there? So you're just you're just riffing in your mind about the ideas. You don't. It's not like allocated time to do it. Um, and so I have a lot of time, um, and I have a lot going on in my mind, and I just try to mix all of that and. Uh, just really grateful for where my life has taken me. It isn't without complexity and and tragedy, but I'm just I'm, I'm grateful for uh, for the nuance and the depths it's uh, it's revealing to me at this age of uh, 48. Mm, sound like the stars aligned for you with, with that is amazing. I mean, um, for people who are listening on audio as well, you have to Google a picture of Rahul, incredibly good looking, handsome man. Is it fair to say that Photoshop you're... is excellent? <laughs> is, is it fair to say that you're not your sort of stereotypical surgeon? Yeah. Well, first of all, I mean, you know, I'm I'm into the patient stories. So most of the surgeons, yeah, we're, we're speaking in generalizations, but mm -hmm. um, I, I love the craft. But in brain surgery, the stories are amazing. The ways that people change from the disease they carry. Uh, before they see you to the ways they may be altered after you do your surgery. I mean, it's just, I mean, thousands, I mean, oh, thousands of patients I've operated on and I've met thousands even more, right? You don't operate on everybody you see. Just the exposure to humanity mm. is something I'm just, and through my own struggle, through what's going on in my life, what's going on in the patient's lives, my kids are older. This book is really a synthesis of that, um, filled with optimism, filled with insight that I think whatever station or place you are in your life, that there's something in there you'll connect with, whether it's, mm -hmm. a, whether it's a tragedy or a triumph, you know, there's stuff in there with that. Um, and so it's been a real special thing that they would give me a chance to share those thoughts. Um, those heavy titles, you know, trauma, self threat. I mean, they were like, these are, these are themes in themselves. I said, let me have a shot at it because I want to bring, bring insight to it from my cancer patients' journeys. Like what I've seen through them on those topics. Mm -hmm. So it's not really, it doesn't have a lot of philosophy in there, but like, how does that, I mean, can you imagine being a cancer patient? I know you, you mentioned your mom and my mom also had breast cancer when I was young. She's doing fine. And man, you go in and get those scans. That's trauma every time. Can you, you're in the machine and then you're waiting. Mm -hmm. Did it show something? You know, am I going to spiral based on the findings or am I going to spiral upward? That's a lot to just brace for privately, usually, and repeatedly for cancer patients. So watching how people handled it was, I mean, it was a master class in studying, you know, coping and, um, you know, the way they, the way they don't just endure, they, um, some of them thrive, some of them blossom. I'm not saying I want cancer. I'm not saying I want, I'm just saying that if it occurs, they have some people, not all of them, not all of them have been, been triumphant. Some have suffered badly, no question, but some have surprised me with what they have found, um, meaning, purpose. Um, and that's sort of the stuff I'm writing about in this mm -hmm. book is the, uh, the lessons and the insights. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's absolutely unbelievable. As I said, I, I love to read the book so much and, it's strange because like through trauma or through in, in your patient's cases, cancer, or, you know, for my example, I had chronic fatigue for like seven years and that was one of the best educations I ever had mm -hmm. in, in self, in life. Um, and you can learn that yourself through those experiences, but also you can learn things like you have through your patients. And I know you've also had your own experiences of trauma, but that's an education in itself in the same way. When I speak with a guest for the podcast, I can learn huge amounts through mm -hmm. what they've 
experience themselves. So as far as I was concerned, like who better to have a book about that than yourself who's experienced so much like that education is very, very unique. Like there's only so many people who have seen the things that you've seen. What what would you say? Because I can't imagine that everybody has reacted in a positive way when they hear news like you've got cancer. Like I I don't think you would ever see that for yourself in your life. So when people hear those words like what's what's a what's a typical reaction and then and then what are like the kind of the more negative responses and the more positive responses that you've seen so there are i i want to give that answer but i also want to provide um sort of nuance and complexity to something like that right so for example if you've never had cancer and you have a lump and you have a biopsy, that's a different sharing of that diagnosis than you've had cancer and you get your usual scans, you know, and you think they're clean, they're gonna be clean, and then you have to hear that your cancer has come back. So like, there are a lot of layers about that. Mm. Or you've, the biopsy you've heard now in clinic is positive for breast cancer or some kind of cancer. Now you go to surgery and you're wondering, is it going to be just where it grew, removable and curable? Or is it going to have spread locally that changes your whole trajectory? So when you talk about like sharing the diagnosis, of, I mean, there's a world of complexity there, right? And I, what I try to see is every patient of where they're at and, um, and how to share that with them. Um, when somebody gets a diagnosis of brain cancer, um, they're going in a bit guarded because the pictures hint towards it being cancer. We don't know how bad or what type, but they go in a bit braced. So those patients afterwards, um, at recovering from surgery, you have to be thoughtful that they may be on morphine, which is a in the hospital given for pain. So their emotional response, I'm not just talking about being groggy, right? I mean, uh, it changes your perception of crisis and joy. I mean, the effects of opioids on, on the mind are more than just numbing. Mm. They create an optimism uh, in some of my patients. So when you share that information, you kind of have to look and see, are we really having this conversation while they're on morphine or do I wait and come back eight hours later mm -hmm. or give them a piece of the information now, let them brace the next, you know, so there's a, there are a lot of layers. And what I do is I, I, I give them time because what I've learned is, I mean, thousands of patients I've talked to about cancer, but for that patient, it's that first conversation. And if I go in there and I motor, you know, the surgery went fine. I did want to share with you the, the little piece of that tissue we took out was put under a microscope by the other experts and, and um, it's looking like it is cancer. Uh, you know, if, if you just keep going through that, that, I mean, can you imagine being on the other mm -hmm. side? Like, wait, 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 surgery. So I like to just, I like to have these awkward moments of silence. They're awkward for me, but you know, then you need a minute to, to to really replenish psychologically that surgery went fine. In my mind, if I know it went fine yesterday or like hours ago, I'm already on to the next thing, but mm -hmm. surgery went fine. And then you can see them fill up. That's a big deal because it's, 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 I mean, surviving and coming out of brain surgery and moving and thinking that by itself warrants, deserves a bit of, um, a bit, a pause. So you let them fill up um, and then you have to, because that, that actually helps them focus for what's coming next. And then um, depending on the language, depending on their, uh, um, their cognitive function, because sometimes the cancer can disrupt how they think, depending on if family is around, depending on if they have a good relationship with their family. I mean, you see it all in the hospital. I love I love the masterclass of the hospital. I mean, just the most complex human interactions in one building. Uh, that's always fascinated me. So I liked when I when I do share with them that it, it looks 
um, you know, it, it is cancer, then I just wait. I just let them free fall. Hmm. Yeah, because because everybody comes into it. Maybe they had a loved one. Maybe they have a genetic risk. Maybe they saw something on TV. Maybe you know you just got to let people. You got to you got to bring it to them fairly, clearly. Let them hear that authenticity in your voice, and then just you know let them go on that journey on their own. That you know. So I have this. It's not a structure, you know. It's but it's a process. I found letting them. And then, and then have that air knocked out of them with that word is, is, is that's their right to run through their whole mind about what it means to hear the C word. And in my opinion, that's when they see that proverbial white light, you know, that en end of life white light. All of a sudden, this, the finish line is visible. It might be, and then that's when I, then I, then I like to be, then I like to speak in, in ways in which people understand. And I say, well, but as we discussed, with treatments, you will, you may choose. Not that I offer. <laughs> I'm not, you know, you came to me in your time of crisis, and now I'm offering you decisions that empower you. I'm not working for the hospital. I'm not working for anybody. I'm just letting you know. In the world, here are the approaches people take. Some don't do anything. Others go for everything on the treatment menu. And I let them know that if you do, that uh, years are in your future, but unlikely decades. And to me, that has worked well for them because right away they're thinking months. Oh my God, oh my gosh, oh my God. I, 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 you know, and then you say years, and you can see them fill up again that, okay, okay, I've got some time. Um, for whatever they imagine, the finish line is in sight, but not it's not right up on me. But you also have to be fair that you can't, if you know, if one only one out of a hundred patients has made it a decade, and um, you know, your mom's cancer, I don't know the details, but the ones I'm dealing one with are people whose cancers have spread all over their body or you know, advanced you know, brain cancer. So, overwhelming majority only live a few years. So I try to, I don't say you can make it a decade. I'm not trying to take away the miracle for them. But to me, that's been the right way that years, because they're, they're only hearing words. You know, they're not hearing the prognosis might be this. And with these treatment options, you may have this kind of, what is that? I mean, I can't understand that, brother. So they hear years, they hear cancer. The surgery went fine. They hear cancer. They hear years, not months, but they also hear unlikely decade. So decades. So th that is my um, process with them and they respond i mean i mean it's hard to tell you know man it's their interior life some are braced some don't say anything some cry of course they cry some wail but i don't know what they're thinking inside and i don't know if i ever can until i get to that moment and even then it'll be my own journey so it's a, the whole world of cancer is just so so it offers such a rare insight into the complexity of humanity I'm grateful to my patients um, and I'm still learning from them. That's amazing. Thank you so much for sharing that. It's so fascinating to hear like, is it so normal for you? And I'm sitting here, I'm, I'm in awe listening to how you explain people hearing probably the most, the scariest thing they're ever going to face. And I'm you, a cancer surgeon, not a plastic surgeon, you know, that chose this. Yeah. Hmm. I chose yeah. this. You know, Rahul, I'd love to talk a little bit later about the journey to that. Take Flight has a lot about <clears throat> how you got into the career that you got into. I know you've, you've spoken and written about how it wasn't the traditional path, but before we do, I'm fascinated just with what you shared about how patients cope with hearing things like that. Like, what have you taken from that yourself and applied into your own life, whether you're facing you know trauma or dealing with any type of stress like have you do you take anything from your patients yeah i mean that's what this whole book is about in the beginning i thought about you know in the beginning you're just trying to take care of them you sometimes miss the story there that they bring because you're actually just thinking about the, the the technical aspects of your job and i would say that was me in my 30s um 
And then as you care for patients long enough, you see them through their year journey for the few years and, you know, I've taken care of thousands of patients and thousands of patients have died also. Um, and you start to think about what, what is the, what is the meaning here? This, these waves of cancer patients that come, my connection with them for moments, for months, usually. And then they move on and you get the invitation to the funeral and you get the thank you for caring for our mom or something like that. And you're, you're just, all of that is washing through you in some way, right? And you, and only now in my 40s am I starting to think about that. And, and I think what I've learned, then, and it can't be taught, is that, that no one can take this journey for me. Especially this last year, man, they were getting cancer surgery and coming out and there's not even somebody waiting for them. Families weren't allowed in the hospitals. I mean, they're in the ICU. And there's nobody there. I mean, think about that. You're getting cancer surgery and cancer treatment alone and everybody's got masks on and all this stuff on their face. You are, you are, you cannot be, you know, you, that journey, <laughs> no one can go on that with you. That's, that's, that's what I've learned. I mean, there isn't a simple takeaway here where like, I've learned to do this one, two, three, you know, that those tips that people are being offered in sort of pop psychology, I think is creating a, a wave of frustration when they don't work or they don't apply. Um, it's, you know, it's hard to say, be mindful. Hmm. You had cancer surgery, you got a cancer diagnosis and everybody you're seeing has got goggles and masks you can't even you can't even read their energy I mean, they're, 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 or their mouth or movement you know you even their eyes you're in there alone and so no one can take the journey f for us and also no one can spare us from the journey you know life at times is difficult and that's that's not meant to be pessimistic or depressing but that's the clarity i have gained from my cancer patients that whether they go into it and they they are they have you know constructive coping mechanisms or they go into a destructive coping mechanisms you know i prefer whether they get these titles of uh at addiction or anxious or uh a lot of times you know non-compliant that's the most bizarre hospital term i've ever heard he's non-compliant with his meds well that's his choice hmm. you know that's her choice I mean, what do you mean non-compliant <laughs> they're electing to take those pills and maybe they take some maybe they don't that's their journey and so wherever they are in that um i have seen the the widest range of it and what i will tell you is i don't assume that I am strong enough or have seen enough that I'm going to be on the spectrum of, of well-being versus distress if that calamity hit me. Um, because I might, I might be a poor coper. I might have some destructive habits for a while. I might not. I, I don't know. But what I do know is if and when that moment arrives um, that I have developed... I'm going to use this word very carefully, resilience. It's overused, but I've, I have developed some fortitude through age and experience. Yet if I stumble or if I struggle, um, that doesn't mean I didn't have it before that moment. It just means maybe the hit was that hard. And I saw this in children's hospitals when they lost their children. You know, they, it, it, the death of a child, who am I to say you're not resilient or you are resilient? Wait a second. I can't put myself in those shoes. Hmm. I might be the most balanced, the the owner of my own well-being, and that moment hits, and I and I might just, you know, I might be an addict. I might commit suicide. I've seen patients, I mean, wonderful families, wonderful people just fall apart after the death of a child. I don't assign the title of they were resilient or not resilient. So when I thought about this term, I started reading, you know, like you mentioned about your grandfather, and there's there's two types of resilience. The engineering definition is, you know, you push something and it doesn't, it bends and it comes back to form. But the psychological definition is very different. And there's two types. One is systemic resilience. 
So simply put, that's the fight you have in you. Earthquake happens, pandemic happens, you maintain. You don't get rocked. That's the that's the systemic resilience. You might just have it or you might have built it through a life. Okay, that's and then there's processive resilience. That's the resilience you're about to demonstrate. That's the fight in you you didn't know you had. And that's what the world is going through in this last year, right? We all got rocked. And now we're going to see there's no way to prepare for last year, right? You can't be like, well, I was resilient coming in and I'm resilient coming out. No, you have. we all came in with a certain amount of resilience and, and, and coping mechanisms, good ones, bad ones. And now this year was a global test, a stress test of our minds. And now there's an opportunity, despite how we are at this moment, falling apart or on the rise, to demonstrate the resilience that's in us, right? It's not just the fight you have in you. It's the fight, the fight you're going to demonstrate now that you're engaged in this crisis. So that is a bigger, more inclusive definition of resilience. It's actually the, the accurate one for psychological resilience. So wherever you are at this moment, that's not your full story. You might have come in strong. You might have come in weak. Whatever's happening now, you might fumble in the future or you might in that moment, you might something surprising might come up from you, a strength that no one saw in you that you didn't see in yourself that way. People feel possibility when they hear the word resilience. And so that's what I you know, mentioned in the book as well. That's an accurate neuropsychological definition. Uh, a lot of times we don't have room for that in the magazines and TV shows, right? Um, like it's considered a static trait. Are you resilient or not? Are you tall or not? Mm -hmm. you know, are you brown or not? It's No, it's not like that. It's dynamic. Um, so that's what I've learned from my patients. Unbelievable. So just, just to clarify on the resilience thing, because I think that's huge. So many people, as you rightly said, talk about resilience and the importance of it, but not many really define it like you've just said it. So systemic is, as I'm understanding, kind of what we demonstrate probably most days and what we yeah. know to, ha to have well, about How ourselves. tough you are walking into the crisis. Mm. How and tough you are walking into the fire. And the second one was? That when, when, when under fire, you know, the strength you demonstrate that you didn't know you had. Huh. Interesting. I think it's that's what so you bring to the fight and what the fight brings out in you. Because I've seen some people, I'm like, oh, you're not going to do well. And under stress and crisis, they show something. So hmm. it's what you bring to the fight and what the fight brings out in you. Process hmm. Systemic uh, resilience is what you bring to the fight. You got it in you. And processive resilience is what the fight brings out in you. That's superb. That's absolutely superb. I don't, this, this is like non relevant to surgery, but that to, to put that example into the real world, we recently did a campaign with a, they're a car company or car manufacturer called say oh. And we did some work with them, um, around mental health awareness, which it was mental health awareness week this, this week just gone. And we created four videos where we provided practices that can help people, which I'd love to speak with you about what, what you use, but help them to manage their mental health. Um, one of them was about music. And we had this musician from the, the UK planned to be um, in the video. We we're going to interview him and just hear his views on it. Cancelled on the morning and we only had the videographer for that day. So we were thrust into a situation where we didn't have an alternative. We had to come mm. up with something there and then. And we've now put all the videos out. And on reflection, that was by far the best video we made versus the other ones which spent we went we spent weeks or months putting together scripts storyboards and all this other stuff planning it all but when it got to this crisis moment that we had again not comparable to illness or cancer, it. but in in this business world it, it created something far better than what we'd imagined in the first place so i think that's really interesting that, that you explained it like that and i like that mention so the lessons from you know the lessons apply at the daily level listen that's an extremely stressful environment so stress and pain is a personal dimension just like that in the operating room, there are, there are crises and obstacles you face that you can't see in a book. You know, it's crisis management. And often that's where some creativity or new approach is born. So we don't want to have stress and crises, but if there's a way to put it to use, um, then, then that builds your, you know, systemic resilience that makes you like, hey, I'm not, next time I'm not, I'm not going to be so afraid of that. I can manage that. I can manage some of these things not working. I did it last time. I learned this. I didn't learn that. And it, but it takes 
rumination. It takes deliberate thinking. You don't just, you don't go through it and then just see what happens. Like it takes reflection, mm-hmm. you know, um, not preserve, not, not, not to like perseverate over it, but just, you got to look back and then say, okay, all things were falling apart. I had these couple opportunities. I went this way. I went that way. This is that kind of worked out. I think, and what that does is it gives you that like uh, that it gives you that you, you it adds emotional regulation. So the next time you get to it, the freak out factor is a little less. You're like, okay, I, I've handled that fight, and I've handled this thing, I've handled that thing. I think I can get get through it this way. Then op, that operation went this way, but that one was this way. If I connect those two, I can handle it. Th- that's that's systemic resilience. That's that's life. On the other side is Captain Sullenberger. Uh, Captain Sully, who landed that plane in the, I mean, and then people are like, hero, hero, hero. I met him in a, at a launch at Los Angeles television uh, studio just briefly. I mean, so composed. He should he should be president of, of several countries. I mean, just <laughs> grit, gravitas, composed, smart, uh, just talented. And and what he. And what we shared was that they brought the the pilot uh, how to reduce errors in air in flights to how to reduce errors in the operating room. So there's a little bit of an overlap with that. Mm-hmm. And we had our conversation, and um, and uh, I didn't broach it directly, but when the movie came out, after doing that, right, you're you got all these people behind you. Your engines are out. You're like, can't make the wrong. Oh my god, sorry. Yeah, I don't even. I can't imagine. I'm curious about how he, what his emotional regulation was. Did he pull it off while freaking out or was he just, did he activate some breathing ritual he has or developed over 20, 30, 40 years of flying? I was, I'm curious about his sort of the brain physiology and electricity at the same time after that legendary, um, he, he struggled with his own mental health quite a bit. And so I think, that's what I mean about the earlier example. How can I judge that, you know, there's, is there going to be a parade after that moment for you? Do you walk around saying, I'm the best, look what I did, I landed that? Or are you actually wrecked from that crisis that you pulled off and managed? And, and I love that about him was that we, had, we, have, every, we have every reason to think he was going to be like Neil Armstrong, and, but it really, it really destroyed him psychologically a bit. Uh, to where he did not have uh, constructive coping mechanisms. Hmm. And I just thought, okay, so be careful what you wish for. And um, and so this journey with my patients, it's sort of a, you know, I felt like in the beginning I was like, I was traumatized what they were going through. And now I'm sort of fortified by having seen uh, their journey but not really having to bear the full weight, right? I'm not the one with cancer. I'm with them, but it you know, affects me. I mean, it's, you know, I lose sleep over it, but then, but then I walk away. So I, I sort of, I feel guilty that I, I, that I don't, when their airplane crashes, I bail out. Hmm. Um, I had a lot of issues with that. Like, um, but now I see it as an opportunity that they have allowed me to join them in their in their most intimate and uh, moments of 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 crises and depth. And uh, so I I have to be uh, to put meaning to this. I have to learn from them. Otherwise, that's just patient number two thousand twenty four. It can't be that way for me, mm-hmm. you know. And um, and um, you know, and that's where we're at, man. Yeah. Unbelievable example with the, the 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 Sully landing in the Hudson River, as well. Um, there's so many compar- like things to draw on with what you do as well. You mentioned then just about how when the you know when the plane crashes you bail out. So I think what you're uh, alluding to there is so if a patient's procedure doesn't go successfully, you live to fight another day and they're not here. Is that is that what you mean? Right. Yeah. Or when when their years are up, hmm. I keep living. You know, they, um, they, um, I mean, I can't, it's, I can't save them. <laughs> they understand that. I understand that, you know, it's all, it's like always coming into a burning airplane, pulling up the nose for a few years and then parachuting out and then they go on, you know, hmm. 
So I, I've tried to, uh, you know, I've tried to put that in a better place um, with what what I've learned from all of those all those crashing airplanes. You know, that's mm-hmm. that is the uh, uh, that is the journey. But I chose this. I chose this. I'm not a victim by any means. I'm grateful. I thank them for letting me join them on their journey. Is that is that the difference between coping with that and being at peace with it? Is that the the victim mentality versus having gratitude for your your position? Yeah. About there's no way to cope, man. It's just I mean, thousands of patients I've cared for have died. I mean, I don't know how to put that. It's a brilliant question you just acted. That that's the nuance that I think this book will afford, and what we're trying to have in this conversation is. I haven't coped. I haven't, I haven't, I'm not mindful about, you know, I haven't, it's not in a good place, man. It's not a, it's not a good thing to have. It's, you can't put the word good or bad or cope or not cope. I'm at peace with the fact that thousands of patients have relied upon me. I have done my best. They have not lived. I have lived not because there was a mistake, but that's the journey they were on. They, they came to me in, in the last few miles of their marathon and I tried to help them get further. Mm-hmm. And um, and I'm at peace with that. <laughs> I mean, do I do I think of certain patients and if it tears me up? Oh, yeah. Is that constructive coping or destructive coping? I don't know. But just like I would never ask, I would never judge what a parent goes through when a child passes away. Um, the ones who know me best and the ones who care for me, they understand that there's no way to understand what what that experience is like to be a cancer surgeon for over 20 years. That, that is, that is in my own personal journey. And I've tried to find some meaning and purpose from them, but I'm mm. at peace with it, but it doesn't feel good. Hmm. Yeah. I, well, I was going to say, I can imagine. I don't, I don't know if I can. My, my dad often says to me, regardless of what we're going through, whatever the circumstances, as long as we can truly say to ourselves that we acted in good faith, we did our best, mm. then, that helps us with that journey. Yeah, that's good advice. Um, that's good advice. Um, yeah. Um, <clears throat> Raul, I'm so sorry. Could you just give me one minute? My wife is blowing up my phone. I just need to put my no, dog I mean, away. So I've got to do something too. And I, okay. as long as you keep this part in the podcast and don't splice it out, that we just took a break to take care of our loved ones and dog and stuff like that. Hundred percent, that's real. That's funny, right? That's exactly real. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's I'll, I'll, I'll be one minute. All right, Thanks. no editing this. Here's my dog, by the way. Here's my oh, dog. Oh man, I feel better already. <laughs> this is the best therapist in the world. <laughs> I'll tell you about the one we got a year ago. It kept my family together. Oh, really? I, I bet. Honestly, Rescued man. by a rescue. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. I'll be back in one sec. Yeah. Take your time. Don't rush. There we go. Thanks, Raul. You okay?
Hey, good tip about the microphone because um, it, this doesn't look weird in the shot. No. Okay. It, it's obviously a microphone. Yeah. It look, I mean, it looks as weird as mine looks. <laughs> <laughs> because it's not foam. Or would it look better like this? It does look better like that. There you go. But like that or like this? I think they both look good. I mean, what are you thinking for like when you're on TV? Yeah. Maybe put the mic a little bit more so it's more obvious. You'll have a bigger shot on TV anyway, right? Normally. Yeah. <laughs> my first day with it, my son, my son was teaching me, but it totally changes the the sound. It's It makes a big difference. Yeah. The, de the depth of the voice, right? I, um, I never actually did... Uh, remote interviews until the pandemic i always did face to face like i'd fly to california and do them mm. and, um you know so i was uh, you know as much as i was looking forward to speaking with you slightly disappointed i couldn't come and and meet you face to face and and do it that way but yeah th these things are great when we're doing them remote so you, let you, me you ask you something job. is this too close no that's great too or how about here they're both good but you can hit you tell me how it sounds right i speak a little bit quieter when i go this close because it's really sensitive and then I sit back like here and it's still good, but you can hear it. It's a bit... That's too far back, I think. Yeah. That's like, so I sit in somewhere around here. Yeah. And then you, you, you can change the uh, the gain on the back here. And what the does that do? So you can change the volume um, on how, how sensitive it is. So let me, let me check with you. So this is gain all the way to the left. One, two, three, four. In the middle, one, two, three, four. All the way to the right, one, two, three, four. Yeah, so I'd say somewhere between the the first one and the middle one for you. Got it. Done. Yeah, yeah that'll make a big difference. Um, you got these things here as well, right? Uh -huh. So you can see that where mine is on this setting. Third one, yeah. So that means it's recording like here to me here. Directionality. Yeah, and then there's another one, which is this like eight symbol here, uh -huh. which records here and it records there as well so if you wanted to interview somebody else or speak with got somebody it. else that it would pick it up the other side got it um good stuff yeah all right <laughs> um how are you for time now Raul? like what's when when do you need to jump off how long are your podcasts usually i mean well, i'm here to work with you support you i feel great that you're including me i mean you know i got i got time amazing yeah i'll probably try and keep it to like another half an hour something like that perfect um, I try to because I've got about a million things I want to ask you. So I try to keep it. Yeah, and, and we'll just and we'll we'll go through them a bit more quickly. Uh, we'll just keep jamming, but I'll I'll pick up the pace if we got a half hour. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. Don't, don't feel like you need to rush. You know, if I okay. go to forty five and you're happy with the time, then that's great too. Um, right. Where were we? <laughs> I think what I'll, I'll move into. Um... Oh, did you hear that? Mm. -mm. That's my 10 month old. She just got home. Oh, so uh, that's uh, first baby. First baby. Oh, that's life changing. So that's, um, you know, when we talk about self, I'll, I'll yeah. ask you about that for sure. Cause that's, that's changed a lot. But um, oh, wow. that's the first time I started actually paying attention was my, when my son was born, hmm. was 20, 27. Up till then I was just, just going wild and getting things done. And then I started thinking about, wait a second, I, you know, I want to, I want to impact him. Hmm. Um, I didn't know how, but I wanted to leave my impact on my children. So it's not just about success. There's so much more than that, but hmm. I wanted to have an influence and impact on them. And now he's almost 20. Can you believe it? So, wow. Yeah. Wow. He's taller than me. He's going to college, university, and the other ones are essentially 17 and 16. And, and, um, that's the, the the first 14 and i just you know when they were younger i enjoyed them but from like 12 to 15 that's really when i started opening up the mic in my head to them just go, traveling with them internationally what do you think of that what do you think of that what do you think of this food what you read on this just just trying to get into their heads in a positive way in an, teaching them from the lessons i had it was so mm -hmm. and then they turned about 15 16 and they can't be found so just realize your windows are Playtime mm -hmm. for now, like the way I think about it is when they're young, put them in gymnastics, get them physically sound and coordinated, hold them, love them, get the language tight. 
I never, you know, people are like, oh, you're a brain surgeon. You must be pushing school. Oh, man, not at all. We just, just, they'll be fine. We want them to have um, sort of a, a breadth of social interactions and physical interactions and feeling of safety and, and, and warmth and love. And then I dialed it up when they got to be like, you know, in 12 and 13. So what do you think about this? Let's read this article together. What do you think about this? Where are they going with this? You know, really coaching was 12 to 15, mm -hmm. 12 to you know, 11 to 14. After that, just let them fly. Then you sit back and you see how they do. And they start telling some of the stories. I saw one of my sons. He's like, well, yeah, well, that was the time I went to, uh, you know, I went fishing or I know that was in, that was the other one. That's the time I, my father and I, we went to Russia and I was like, oh, he's bragging about all that stuff. I was doing with him. <laughs> just sit, I'm just sitting back now. <laughs> I'm just sitting back now and seeing how they're putting it all together. And, uh, and uh, I've influenced them. I've impacted them and uh, we'll see what they do with it. You know, mm, amazing to hear. I've got all that ahead of me. It's, yeah. She's 10 months and it's just been the biggest blessing in the world. It's oh, yeah. I've changed. Yeah. dramatically i think like just the way i view my my lens of the world has just changed i'm not selfish well i'm still selfish but i'm not as selfish anymore it's the first time i've you know you can understand things on a level and i always kind of knew that i put myself first and i and the world revolved around me and you have this feeling of a sense of self that everything impacts you you don't consider others as much and this has really dawned on me in fact i thought about this like in the shower this morning it really just hit me i was like fuck yeah i it, it, everything that happens to me impacts other people too. Yeah. And they all have their own shit too. Yeah. And yeah, it's just, again, we were talking about educations and how trauma can educate like children. She's been the, the biggest education as well. I know that, that, that fuck moment happened for me when my first one was born and my wife had a C-section. So she was on pain pills and like the first night I about the size of this microphone and I'm lying there and he's on my chest from like Adam's apple to like not even down to my stomach. And I'm just like, oh, man, it begins mm -hmm. that it. I'm sure he would have done fine anywhere else, but it began for me. It began for me. I was like, this is this is this is the selfishness I want to have. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm selfish about my love for my son. I'm selfish to see him turn into something. That is his potential, not an outcome, not a job, not a, not a career. No, no, no. Just the cultivation of his mind and spirit and body. I was really into that. So I, that big boy of mine, he's 20. I was talking about the other years uh, that day with him. We we're like, we started running through the, the map and we were like Panama, Nicaragua, El Salvador, Bolivia, Peru, Ukraine, London. I mean, England, of course. Um, Russia, we just started going through the map in Asia. And I thought, you know what? Those weren't family trips. I took him to nine countries, just me and him. Hmm. By the time he's 19. Well, I just, I thought, you know what? <laughs> that was, that was well done. That's the proper kind of selfishness. I enjoyed those trips. I've got, you know, I was rolling out doing surgery and Somebody was with us. They'd watch me. Just been everywhere, man. Just the connection you have with that. And I did that with the second boy, and I'm doing that with the third boy too. That that's motivate. I'm selfish for that. Hmm. I want that time with them. You know, yeah. it's good. It's good <laughs> selfishness if there is such a thing. But <laughs> that was by design. I encourage you to. That's where the parenting happens. That's where the memories. The, I mean, the memories are glacial, but that's where like the conversational memories happen. Oh yeah, that time. Yeah, what were you doing in Panama? What were you doing in Peru at Machu Picchu? Um, alone with him, father and son. And I've done that with all three of my boys. Hmm. And that that's, you know, it's kind of letting me, we're, we're a digression, but I think it's very important. You said about doing things with good faith and being at peace. It's allowing me now to step back and just watch them with their girlfriends, with their boyfriends, with their family, with other people. I can be a spectator in their lives and really sit back and enjoy because I parented them with dedication and, and with good faith, you know. Um, and that's, again, that's liberating because I'm not looking back and saying, I wish I would have, I wish I could have, mm -hmm. you know. Now I'm like, see where this goes. Hmm. You've earned that like feeling of no regret. Well said. Huh. 
It sounds amazing. How does it feel? Because I have these thoughts of everything flashing in front of me. Like we just we just took her into nursery <laughs> for for thirty minutes yesterday. Like this one of, one of these settling in sessions, so that we take her in for forty five minutes tomorrow, and you know we get her used to this thing. And it's like this this year is just flown by. She's going to be one in mm. seven, seven weeks and. Yeah, how do you feel like with your eldest now getting ready to go to college and how quick that 20 years has gone? Yeah, there's no question. I mean, but I have no regret because I got an extra year with the pandemic. He stayed down. He stayed here with us mm -hmm. with uh, the first year of his uh, college. I put in some mileage with him internationally. One time, so in February of 2020, I was telling some people close to me, you know, hey, this thing's going to blow. Uh, this pandemic is going to, and they're like, and he told one friend or, a, and, and I heard him saying, and I want you to know that this is from my dad, who is the least alarming, at uh, least alarmist person on the planet. He took me to Ukraine when I was 14. And when I said, isn't there a war going on? He said, no, 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 that's on the Eastern edge. We're going to be on the Western edge. <laughs> so, and that's, you know, that you can't, that that kind of I don't know that just kind of whatever that is he's so he's just got it you know and so just the conversation the thinking the explanation he's like that guy who would take a son uh, to Nicaragua that like two years later had political instability and was like I've taken him to Nicaragua and Ukraine not the usual places and I was telling everybody that was close to me that that asked that in February I said this thing's gonna blow and um, and those kind of lessons with them are are important but if i look back so i got a good friend uh greg white he's an olympian for england and uh, he's also got a phd in physiology and sometimes that conversation is the best because we kind of know each other's space and looking back what i would say is they got to feel safe they may not be safe like we had Sirens going off and bomb threats in Kashmir when I was a kid, you know, but I felt safe. I don't look back at that. And, you know, whatever my mom and dad did, I felt safe. Mm -hmm. Some people are behind gated communities in Los Angeles and don't feel safe. So that feeling of that somehow making the child feel safe is is super important for their threat response for the rest of their life. That thermostat, be careful with that. Number two they're not born moving like the gazelle that just lands and removes, right? So, I, you know, my buddy Greg White mentioned that. He said, I think every kid should do six months of gymnastics, not to go into it, but just learn how to somersault and move just to get maximally coordinated with their limbs and balance. I thought that's brilliant, man. What You don't have to do anything after that, but set that thermostat also using the left hand, how to fall. Mm -hmm. And then... Keep in mind that psychiatric illnesses, they tend to pop late adolescent, early 20s. Like there's a, if you look at schizophrenia, it happens like this, the story in medical school is 22 year old male in college or 19 year old female in university. All of a sudden, those things that are the, whatever's going on with the brain, late teens, and I think we know this, but I would just impart upon people that that there's a electrochemical shifting. You're, it's not like structurally it's doing anything. There are no wires. I'm trying to get people to think of the brain as an ecosystem. And we use words like that. When you're born, you actually have more neurons, then you prune them. And then the ones, because you don't need some of them. You're not activating some of them. So the brain says, hey, I'm going to let those go. But the ones you do have by interacting and engaging, they grow more branches. They, it's, the term is arborization. So pruning and arborization are true neuroscience, like hardcore neuroscience terms. So if we get away from wires, which, which implies a directionality and get to, I, I want more branching in my neurons and we get to seasons of growth and winters of dormancy, that's real biology. I mean, I'm not like just, this isn't like some creative thing, man. I'm mean, going to send you papers with language in there. So I'm trying to bring that language here rather than we're wired for this, we're wired for that. And so if you see your, your teenager's mind as, as branching in certain ways and those electric neurons are spraying chemicals and electricity, it should inspire people like 
I want to have a close engagement if possible in this window. So the physical window is, you know, learning to walk and all those things, you know, five and below. The the safety window is their whole life, but especially early. And and for me, the just getting in their head, uh, you know, age 11 to 15 was, was a, a strategy that I had. I might have failed, you know, if they would have not done well. Doesn't mean I'm just saying like, I can't guarantee the outcome. But that those approaches, I hope people will hear, have a biological basis for why I'm saying that. Hmm. Not just do it now, do it then. But there's there are shifts going on in the mind and electricity of the brain in late teens. Your arms and legs are learning to connect with your brain five and under. And that thermostat for threat and vigilance, you want to you want to dial that appropriately because if you don't help them set that, then later on in life, they're going to feel under threat when there isn't. And that can be, you know, that can, that can, that, that can get in the way of really a, a well-lived mm. life. That's unbelievable advice. That's unbelievable advice. I mean, it's hard. Yeah. I think and still believe very strongly that one of the best things my parents ever did was tell me that I could achieve anything. And I have people who disagree with that and feel mm -hmm. like that you shouldn't, you shouldn't, you know, fill fill a teenager's head with the, the thoughts that they can do whatever because it can mm. lead to arrogance and overconfidence or whatever. But I still believe that that gave me a sense of self belief that meant that I can go on and go anywhere and do anything. And I don't feel like it's fair for people not to feel like that in this world. There are so many opportunities available to us, and it sounds like you you have a similar belief. Yeah, the, that's an interesting one. Did I tell them? I, I used I used sort of a modified version of that with the kids, you know, and, and maybe it was a bit competitive, but well, if if someone else has done it, then surely you can do it, mm -hmm. even if that's at the highest levels of achievement. So, so before you do something that the world hasn't seen yet, before you really just make us think differently, like a certain musician or an artist or a certain surgeon that does an operation, you're like, wait a second, that's brand new. And the generations will be doing that afterwards. Um, or a leader that transforms us or an astronaut that makes us see the world differently from the perspective of the moon looking down. Like what well, people have done that. So I'm not, I never said to them, you can do anything, but I said, surely you can do what others have done, you know? And, and I always told them the way to approach it is just straight dedication and hard work to get to base camp. Hmm. We can all just, you know, I see that in, in medical training. It's not filled necessarily filled with talented people, but it's filled with dedicated people. So I said, just, just, just muscle it to base camp. Everybody can get to 16,000 feet at the base of Everest. I know it's crowded now, so hmm. the, the example is not as apropos, but get to base camp. And then you're in a position to summit. The summit isn't guaranteed in life, but find what you're what you're aiming for. You know what I mean? Like I, I, I mean, when I dropped out of university, I was like, man, if I could just become a physician of any sort type, I just want to help people. That was my base camp. You know, I was even looking to go to medical schools that weren't in America because I had such, you know, I had such terrible grades in college and I dropped out and they were looking at all these stellar students and then, oh, and this guy, <laughs> he's a mess. <laughs> and I don't blame him, but, but that was my base camp. And then from there, oh, it's been an amazing journey into brain surgery and brain science and talking to you. And now, I, you know, what happened two years ago in London, how a person named Venetia Butterfield from Penguin set me up. She took a book mm -hmm. I had in uh, in America and said, ah, if I change the title and I change the cover and I change and and get back to proper spelling, you know, C-O-L-O-U-R rather than this. Amer I mean, I, I didn't see that potential in me. She set me up and made me relevant for a moment in London. Like, so that's mm -hmm. that's summiting. But the base camp was becoming a physician. So that way I, I leave, you know, so you can do anything, especially if others have done it. Mm -hmm. But in the pursuit of that, don't forget to secure base camp, mm -hmm. which is like shelter, food, you know, because that's when you can really take your shots when you've got your, you know, you've got your day to day living isn't under threat. 
So that's why I'm so impressed with some of my patients who their housing situations aren't secure. That's why I'm impressed with certain people who have who are under threat for a lot of different reasons. Um, yet they aspire, yet they they aim to summit. That's tremendous to me. I've had the luxury of being born into the <laughs> born into the by the you know born to the right parents who provided that thermostat and that that exposure and that stability for me. Um, mm. But I you know I've got a buddy who you know, was in El Salvador and, and came to America at 15 illegally at first, you know, and he's a physician. I just, I look at the stories around me and I start to think, man, I haven't achieved much because I was given so much. So I'm impressed with people who really, um, they look at the same external environment. They say, no, nah, I can do it. Anything is possible. So I like what your dad said. My story might not be anything is possible, but I have seen plenty of stories where there is no explanation of why they have triumphed so well. And so I think it's important. Yeah, anything is possible, especially if other people have done it. But don't don't forget dedication will take you to base camp where those those triumphs are possible. It's such an amazing metaphor. I love it. Yeah. And actually, it was my mum who, who probably said that more than, <laughs> than my dad. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but yeah, I love, you know, I had so many metaphors around, around mountains. That's literally one of my favorites. I'm, mm. I'm so pleased you said that. I'm going to hang on to that. Thanks, man. And, and actually, it's again, I said it earlier that, books come into your life at, at the right time that's just coming to my life at the right time because from from I used to be an athlete as well I played football mm. so achieving things in sport achieving things at school and academics achieving things in business that was all fine because other people had done it it was easy to believe you could do it if another human had done it I'm in this space now where with a podcast and with uh how I work with clients as a coach and and this kind of world which there isn't really a hard and fast formula on making mm. this work so it's the first time in my life where I'm thinking, okay, I can do anything, but how the fuck do I do this? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there's, there's no formula here. So um, that's funny. I'm having si similar experience with uh, with the journey in UK. It's um, there is no formula, and actually, there isn't a, an exact person to follow because it's my journey that's resonating. Hopefully, and I, mm -hmm. and, um, I fell in love with London. You know, I haven't I haven't felt at home in really my whole life and it was it was great to add london as a as a potential home hmm. and now i'm just seeing that i have many homes and many places and um but it is a bit unnerving the uncertainty of saying i'm going to go for it but there aren't these 10 steps to follow and medical school and training is very much like this year you do this next year you do that hmm. i was in medical school for four years and training for eight I mean, for 12 years, I mean, it was like, you know, every year was drawn out. And now not even today is drawn out. And that takes adjustment. But I think from that uncertainty, there's also a constructive pressure that releases creativity. If it's too regimented, you can't cut loose. And if you don't cut loose, you're not going to come up with something fresh. Um, and what you think is fresh, others may not. And so then the 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 burden of the creative process from my pr perspective is you got to come up with a lot of fresh shit. You know what I mean? <laughs> it can't be like, I got it. You got to be a, you got to, you got to have uh, output. You got to have productivity in, in a creative space. And so you got to keep going to that well. And that's not easy. I have a lot of respect for people who do that mm -hmm. uh, because you know, you build that well for your, through your life. And then you get your first book or your, you know, your first sort of, you know, I always just think about Snoop Dogg's first album. Well, Dre called it Chronic. He found him in Long Beach and he, the the the, the album says The Chronic is by Dr. Dre, but most of the songs are by Snoop Dogg. <laughs> and they were so compelling. Every word was, because that was the stuff he was probably thinking about for the last 10, last 10 years. Mm -hmm. If I get my shot, this is what I got. If I, and Dre heard that, he's like, those are all gold. Nobody knows you. I'm on the cover. But, you know, and then the next, uh, and then I thought the real challenge is what's next? Book two, album two. Um, that's where I've started to see. Um, and in surgery, what do you do when the professor's not there? They train you, they teach you these things. Do you advance the field of surgery more than what you have learned? Those, those spaces, um, 
come with uncertainty, just the way you're mentioning, right? I, I don't know where to go with it. And that's where I think that's where my personal growth has happened mm. is, 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 is uh, under the pressure of uncertainty, uncertainty in operating room, uncertainty in relationships, uncertainty in physically being in different places. And, uh, but now I'm starting to see it as a gift. Like that's the, that's the play way to replenish the well. Uh, so where I can pull out more, uh, more creative content. Hmm. When you talk about this well, do you mean like this inner well of strength? Is this what you're going back to? or? What would you um, mean by that? Well, I mean, physically this world, I've lived in a lot of places and I move in a lot of places, you know, and um, that is also uh, those experiences that comes with a bit of uncertainty, but also those experiences replenish the well, I would say the, the, where do you, where do you, where do you keep going to for your creative content? Mm -hmm. And for me, it's been travel, interacting with people, of course, my patients, my personal journey, physically living in different parts of the world, um, having tremendous family and friends and people that I just, we go hard, man. We vibe like this. We just go, mm -hmm. just go. And there doesn't, I, I can't tell you what will come out of this, but you have added to the well where later something creative will uh, will surface. Mm, oh, please, I'm oh, please, Me, mate. I'm getting so much from this. I'm absolutely loving it. It's interesting. You're talking about uncertainty and the mindset of somebody who considers taking something further. Like you said, do you advance medicine, or do you just kind of stick to the rules and follow what people have done before you? And I, the the example that came to my mind then is I, I don't know if you follow rugby or not, but the the New Zealand All Blacks, mm. um, and they have a a mindset or a philosophy that they take the shirt and they leave it in a better place than where they had mm -hmm. than where it was before. And I think that separates so many people to think about taking something further than where it is now, leaving it in a better place rather than, you know, you could argue, and I apologize because I've had a lot of England rugby players on my podcast, but you could say the England rugby players might not have the same sort of mm. philosophy. Um, so yeah, I just thought that was such a great example that you mentioned that just came up for me there. Yeah, and you got that, you know, you got Jordan back there. Actually, he's actually mentioned in my book. People will be surprised if brain surgery mentioned, you know, mentioning Jordan, but um he uh you know, there was a selfishness in the way he played that I think that can be respected also. Mm -hmm. If you don't hurt people, if you don't get in the way of other people's success, if it's an open competition where the rules are established, mm -hmm. that's why I love sport. I got on ESPN a couple of times and I was like, I was on the <laughs> sports center <laughs> and, and uh, you know, you know, my, some of my friends were like, you know, my wife was like, Oh, that's cool. That's fine. But I was like, no, it's like, you know, it's like getting on Oprah or like nightly news or getting on BBC, whatever. <laughs> but being on sports center was just cause I respect sport because they, it's an open competition. Whereas sometimes you see people competing and they're just trying to take advantage of each other. And some, I struggle with business that way where you're just trying to outdo each other and the yeah. rules aren't completely structured, but I love here are the rules, here are the universe, uniforms, here's a referee. It's just, and surgery can be like that. Here is a challenging cancer. There are people in all the major centers taking on those types of cancers and some are better. Some are physically better at getting all of it. Some are physically better at getting all of it and hurting you less. And that's why surgery is just like, just the thing, man, because, um, and it's, it's a team sport kind of, but it's, you know, it's a, it's an individual sport too. And, and I, I think that's why I wanted to go into cancer surgery because the, you know, knee replacements, they all look the same. You're trying to go from 92% affected to 92.2. Cancer surgery, the cancer grows different. It eats up the anatomy different. When you go in there, it's almost like a new enemy every time. You're trying to, you know, you're trying to like dissect the cancer that's grown a different way in a patient that's in, whose anatomy has been eaten up in a different way. It's a physical thing. I mean, there's a whole table of tools. There's a headlight on my head. There are telescopic glasses. That's a physical performance. And what I saw was there are efficient surgeons. It's not like we all do the same 1,000 steps. For a routine operation, it's not like do one through 100. If you're slick and if you're soft, you can do the same work in 62 steps where somebody else might take mm -hmm. a little bit more, more steps, more tissue injury. So that's one, one world. 
Then on the other side is dangerous surgery. Some people, if the patient chooses it, trauma surgery, cancer surgery, uh, transplant surgery, if the patient chooses it, there are people who are physically better at it than others. So when you get medicine in LA or New York, it's the same bag and the same plastic thing, right? It's made in a factory. But what if your disease required the medicine of somebody's physical dexterity and capacity to perform under pressure? What if there was a surgeon in LA or New York or London that for this type of cancer, patients did much better in his hands? Like that's sport. Hmm. And some of the best ones I've seen, they bring the same Michael Jordan perspective. Every little inefficiency, they're just, oh, they're bent out of shape about it. And that's what Jordan mentioned, like, just, oh, I've missed the game-winning shot this many times. They're like, you're Michael Jordan. He's like, yeah, but those shots I missed. And, and my buddies and I are like them, the people I know, there's just, I only remember the people I hurt and the ones I could have done better with. They're like, but you, this and this. I'm like, oh, yeah, but that's. And so we have that thing behind you with Jordan. That's exactly the same way. So under the chapter failure, he's mentioned mm -hmm. in there about uh, what drives people. But the open competition is the most important thing. I think that's healthy competition. Here are mm -hmm. the rules. Here are the goals. International. Uh, doesn't matter what you, what, what, what you were before or not. It's under these lights we see who you are. I mm -hmm. love that about surgery. I love that about sport. It's much easier to measure performance yeah, as well under exactly. those circumstances. There's no judge. Exactly. Mm. <laughs> it went in the basket. Yeah. Yeah. That cancer came out. Yeah. And no, exactly. That yeah. takes out the biases that we all have naturally, you know. But that's great because you were saying about a patient might be might be better in somebody else's care, like in your care, mm -hmm. like when when the Or when somebody the, else's. I'm not saying me, or, but yeah, or some a few things that I'm good at. Yeah, when the drill or the or the or the suture or whatever is in your hands, the same as Michael Jordan when the ball's in his. And you know, I actually I finished your book. I just got um, the Nipsey Hustle uh, biography, and I imagine there might be some similarities in the life stories between between you guys, different yeah. backgrounds. Yeah, well, he's, he's LA, and when yeah, when he, there were a lot of murals about him, and I think even Obama, you know, put mm -hmm. something out. Um, but what I would say is, you know, so you know, rap and art has an arbiter, a judge. Um, but in surgery, um, we, we, we measure who has the best uh, resection rates mm -hmm. and, and who has the lowest complication rates. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you get like, you know, goals and, and, and you know, fouls and rebounds mm -hmm. and stuff like that. There are metrics in surgery. Um, that um, don't require a judge. You know, mm. the scan tells it, the patient's uh, disability or lack of it tells it. So I, I love, I love that part about surgery and being a yeah. surgeon. Yeah, I bet, I bet. And and thank you, by the way, you're making this very easy for me because you're bringing me back to what I want to talk about, which is the surgery aspect. I've been dying to talk about the performance side of of surgery and being a brain surgeon. Um, before I do, I just want to thank you again. I'm absolutely, I'm loving this conversation so much. I, there, there, there are certain ones, and I love all the conversations I have for the podcast, but there are certain ones when I just, I feel it deeply and I'm, I'm yeah. getting that today, so I'm enjoying it. Perfect, man. Um, I mean, look, a really, a really obvious first one to, to open up with, with regards to performance, but just what is it like performing brain surgery? I could only imagine for myself, and we spoke about resilience and those experiences building up that resilience, but if I was to step into that world, you know, I, I would probably be like a deer in the headlights. So yeah. what, what, what is that like even to, to do that? You know, the drapes are up and everything else. Uh, first time, I mean, I had seen, you know, medical school, the belly and different things. And um, the first time I saw them doing, a, a, you know, maybe the surgery your, your mom has had so respectfully, but the first time I saw them lift off the frontal lobe mm -hmm. and then open up the sheath and you can see this beautiful glistening I mean, it's like artwork with little serpentine arteries um, and vessels. I was like, whoa, is that, are, is that even possible? It's the first time I saw a surgery where I was like, is that even possible? Meaning, is the patient going to make it after you do this? Mm -hmm. I was like, whew. And then there was a process of understanding of this and that. And 
then there was a first time I operated alone and it was like, oh my, I mean, it's just a different thing not to have somebody in the room with you, man. It just, oh my gosh, it was, um, I mean, just, just a world of emotions, you know? And, um, what do I know what I'm doing? If I get into trouble here, how will I get out? What if, what about this maneuver? What if, what if he doesn't do well? Or what if she doesn't do well? It's my first, it's my first surgery. If it doesn't go well, then I'll lose my career. I mean, a lot of things, selfish things, generous things, complicated things. Um, but man, it was a thrill to have, it was a thrill to have that, the, to have the wheel and have nobody else in the car with you on that racetrack. I mean, it's just, it's meditative because at that point you're not thinking about all the stuff that was bugging you yesterday or before you just, you are truly in that moment. To me, that's mindfulness. That's meditation. Dem a, an exquisite skill or a demanding situation that requires my full attention. Um, and so that, that was performance. Then the third thing, you know, the first time I was like, whoo, can this be done? Second time is I've got the wheel. And then as I've gotten older, um, it's about um, not losing anybody on the operating table. So in surgery, you take on big cases and dangerous surgery. Sometimes things go wrong. And it's not just sutures and drill. But like, so, so just, just to interject, cutting the skin takes six seconds, but sometimes the operation takes six hours. Mm -hmm. What's going on those next hours and minutes that's the work you can't understand it unless you've done it you know um but then i got to the point where with the bigger cases what i wanted to be good at was not just the finesse and the flow of the operation but if and actually if you do enough complex cases when that captain sully moment hits um am i good then performance under pressure Everything's at stake. Not my life. So not not the same, but I'm into it just as bad as as like my life is online. You know, mm -hmm. it's a human. It's a person. Person I talk to, person I met, person's family I know. So I'm in it. And so then that crisis man. Okay, I've got a new enemy right here. What? Uh, how, how do I how do I land this? 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 That's where I, the last, you know, those are the three steps of performance as a surgeon I've gone through. And the last one is the, is the most personal because what do you do when on your laminated pilot sheet or your surgery textbook steps that what you're facing doesn't hasn't existed before. There is no written solution. You can't pick. You can't call a friend. You know what should I do? And you, it has to be conceived and delivered in that moment, physically. Physical. Like what, if I do this, if I go underneath here, what's on that side? I'm gonna pull pressure for a second. Catch my breath. Catch my breath. Catch my breath. Come back at it. You know, there's that's a personal, private moment. Um. And that's those moments. There are two types of surgeons who freak out and they don't, they freak out and they bail out and the patient doesn't do well. Those are the ones that die in the operating table. Can you imagine a cold body in a room with all these lights on and they were warm when they came in and their family's waiting outside? And you, that's the conversation I never want to have. Um, and then there are people who, freak out but don't freak out i mean don't it's not like you're like no eh, let's see it's not it's not lackadaisical or casual but it's it's lit but focused it's lit but knowing your own emotional regulation about the things that trip you up don't think about how this is going to appear don't think about the family outside get this get this get this get this get this you know there's a whole thing i go in through my mind that i know some of my colleagues they got their own different thing and i can't teach that so either you, you so, and it's not something you are so, uh, you can't know whether you have that. <laughs> like they, they, you go into surgery without even see people seeing if you can like use the pen with your left hand or how you, you know, there's no technical assessment for taking medical students to surgery. You just take everybody in and then you teach them and you assume you're going to teach them all the world's most exquisite technical performance, mm -hmm. right? We're going to take everybody into race car driving. Oh, you're not good at it. 
So there's no filter for that. And then, mm -hmm. and there's especially no filter for how you perform under pressure. So the surgeons, we select ourselves towards that. There are the surgeons that want to take the game winning shot, mm -hmm. Jordan. There are the ones that say, I'm good, happy being on the team, <clears throat> right? Pippen. So the, why would you select yourself toward that? Because it, it teaches you something about yourself. You know, I mean, being able to be in that moment and um, get through a difficult situation in an operating room and knowing you're taking on a new challenge that others haven't across the country, across the world. You know, it, it's, a, it's a life lesson to yourself, that moment inside, alone, under the lights with the headlight on your head and the loops and this patient opened up. You know, that's, to me, that's what surgery can offer for the surgeon. And so my, my ambition to be the best at something matches up perfectly with the patient wanting to me, wanting me to be the best. Mm -hmm. So to me, that's a healthy competition. Me against other surgeons, me against the cancer. That's a healthy competition with rules and referees. And that's where a pla that's the place where I've been able to deliver my, uh, my intensity for what I hope has been, um, you know, for what I hope has been for good. It's, it's so refreshing to hear because I think sport, and we use the sporting analogy a lot mm -hmm. because, every, you know, we all we love do. sport. We played it when we grew up and it is, um, you know, glamorized on the TV. It is. There's no doubt about it. And so it should be because it's amazing and it provides entertainment and escapism and all these other things and inspiration. But people who go in for surgery probably due to fear or other reasons don't give too much consideration about what goes on in hospitals or what mm -hmm. goes on in the operating room mm -hmm. because it's scary right but if we think about it the way you've explained there it is a performance like anything else oh, and, yeah. and you're theater. driven theater yeah yeah in the uk we call it theater because back in the day it was and just a context as well when i left football or soccer my first job away from sport was i worked for ethicon so I sold sutures and staple equipment to, into general surgery um, in London. So, uh, so that was my, so I, I've experienced stepping into theater, watching general surgeons perform colorectal surgery, bariatric surgery, mm -hmm. various things like that. So, and that was trauma in itself, by the way, because I had yeah. to that resilience to see that sort of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the way you explain it, particularly around brain surgery, there's nothing else you can think about. There's nothing else you can, you can be distracted by because it is um, the stakes are so high, I guess. Yeah. And I would say not, not there are, there are brain operations that are not deadly or dangerous. And there are, so I would say dangerous surgery, challenging surgery that the patient has chosen to come to you for. You're not just saying, Hey, I'm gonna have a dangerous operation. No, it's not like that. They come to you with a problem that is dangerous to tackle. And they go to different centers. They go to New York. They go to D.C. They come to you and say, man, you got, a, you got a bomb about to go off inside you. They're coming to me to ask me to take that bomb out of their head. That's why it's dangerous, because of the disease they have. They're, it's not like the surgeon's dangerous or the hospital's dangerous. You're coming to me with a very complicated problem. And the, and the risk can never get to zero. But my hope is in my hands, if in New York or in London, it's 7% chance of death or 7% chance of, uh, you know, injury, that I, I hope that in my, my track record shows that it's only five or six. Hmm. That's winning, right? It can never hmm. get to zero. And uh, there are patients who look for specialized cancer surgeons and surgeons throughout the world. And that's uh, that's the group I, I, I emulated. That's the group I hope I have earned a small place in. And, um, I just want people to know that, that, uh, not all surgeons, right? Because there are, most of it is, is formulaic in its approach, but the elite surgeons are no different than elite athletes. And I got a feeling we chase it for the same reason. Mm -hmm. And I love the fact that if I'm better at this, I'm driven at this, I'm competitive at this. Like my patients doing better than patients in other, in other hospitals. 
I'm at peace with that too, that that ambition is mine, mm -hmm. that that's my selfish ambition to be the best at something. And I would say, that's the surgeon you want. Mm -hmm. Even if it's not me, that's the surgeon you want, who's so jacked up to be the best inside you, fixing you, doing it with the most finesse, the fewest steps, least likely to get injured in their hands. I feel proud that I've done that and or aimed for that. I'll let others decide if I've done that. And I'm 48 and I'm thinking about what, what to do uh, in the decades ahead. It doesn't have to be surgery, but it will always take the lessons from surgery and the lessons from my cancer patients. Do you live by any particular mantra or is there anything you kind of say to yourself, be it before surgery or generally mm -hmm. as like a, as a life goal and those things might change over time. I don't know, but is there any mantras you live by that other people might get something from? Um, well, not, it, there's no, there's no sort of prep before the event kind of thing. Um, but when I had dropped out of university and on my way back, I, um, part of the journey was through South Central Los Angeles at Compton Community College. You know, that's where NWA is, the Williams sisters and Kendrick Lamar now. Um, Nipsey's from South LA, I think so, but. Yeah, cr uh, Crenshaw. Yeah, that's by USC. Um, so on my, um, on my journey back, there was an English teacher there. And uh, he just, you know, uh, he just wrote one thing. He just wrote something that's been um, been my mantra from that age. Gosh, that was 20s. Is, I know he, it, was, it was so so beautiful. I know you'll do well, but I hope you do good. And I thought that's it. That's it. I want both. Hmm. If I can only have one, I, I just want to do good. Because it changes your identity. You know, I, I don't know how old you are, but... Um, because it changes your identity, what you choose to do. If you, if you don't like the man you are, then put yourself to purpose and maybe you'll like the man you become, hmm. you know, that's, uh, that's what I've tried to do. I've failed many times, man. <laughs> yeah. But you learn with each one. I wonder, Rahul, like something that I think about quite often and, and apologies, by the way, I'm trying to respect your time. I've already gone over what I said. No, so no, I'm a good man. Just place yeah. it the way you like. It's great. Yeah. I'm enjoying yeah. it. I don't, you know. Okay. I don't good. live on a calendar. Okay, amazing. Thank you. Um, I often think, can we truly change or are we sort of governed by our conditioning from our youth and the people we spend our time with? The, the, answer, the answer, answer is simple. We can truly change. I can say that with more confidence than than anything is possible, hmm. but we can truly change. And so the answer, I think, has to come from our understanding of the design inside of our skulls, um, the cellular biology. I don't mean like, well, you know, you can change, eat a blueberry, focus on this, look at the moon. I mean, there's a lot of stuff out there that I personally struggle with. But when you come to understand the processes going on in your brain and mind, it's liberating to know that if that can happen at the flesh and at the flesh under a microscope, then it can happen in our lives and our behavior and in our mind. So you can take a, a healthy cell. Cells are the Lego blocks that make up flesh. Like if you see tissue, you see liver or you see brain, you put it under a microscope, it looks like tiles. You know, the liver looks like tiles, but the brain looks like a garden, long stream, like jellyfish. I mean, it's just exquisite. Um, Everything is of different shape in the way they connect. It's 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 not there's nothing rectangular about it. The, uh, but liver and muscle is just like block 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 block. So when you see that the structure is very dynamic, it, it, it liberates you, and it's constantly changing. Thoughts that the garden of your mind creates, the thoughts that your brain create, can actually come back and change the brain itself. So flesh and its magical creation, the mind, white flesh, the brain, and the magical creation, the mind, they, they play with each other. They dance with each other. So the, you have thoughts, but you can turn your attention inward and actually change the flesh from which those thoughts arise. Mm. It's, it's flesh and something greater, always in a reciprocal relationship. 
So change isn't, can we change? I mean, the degree, uh, you might ask that question, but it is a completely dynamic system. I mean, just, just to take you through a global, global sort of scape, you know, you're born with these neurons that don't have branches and then the ones you engage you start creating branches with and then you go through teenage years and electricity is like aurora borealis and you get older and some of the garden garden shrinks but you've got you've got other areas that have created habits to get you to work and get you home and then later on some of your thoughts might wig out and you know you know they might glitch out and you you have dementia but you have other capacities it's a very dynamic thing we know our kids can change from not walking to walking. We know adolescents can change from, uh, you know, not being mature enough to be trusted with some responsibilities, I guess, to being mature enough. That doesn't, it, you have two great examples that the mind and brain always change and to not to let up from age 25 to 75. So my answer to that is we can always change. The change you want might be harder if you're pursuing something I'm not. And the experiences you have will make it harder or easier. But that's where you tie into the stable environment and physical activity and, and, and nurturing environments that leave you leave you the most uh, modifiable version of yourself possible. So absolutely. Mm -hmm. So so how can we really change? Like understanding that garden that you explained, mm -hmm. like the brain is like a garden. And maybe this is a good time to talk about, or, or maybe not, but proprioception, introspection, which you spoke about in your book. Mm -hmm. And that just jumped out at me. And then I added in a third word on the end of that, which is manifestation, which I think mm -hmm. is maybe that they're all tied together. But how can we, if, if people listen in, they're thinking, I'm trying to change my circumstances to understand the way the brain works in order to do that. Like, what can we actually do? Okay. Um, so on this book, takeaways are hard, but I like that question. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to leave people with optimism and complexity. So if you're talking about changing your perspective or changing your behavior. I mean, those are different, but let's take changing your behavior. Um, so the first step is to be able to turn your attention inward. Okay. So you now some people have said, well, if, if you do too much of that, that can be like having depression with rumination. No, but there must be time in the day to sit and think about the events of the day as well as your reactions to those events and give yourself that 15 minutes whenever it is on a bike listening to music i'm not saying it's got to have it's got to be in a yoga mat in malibu no quite the opposite it's it's the diligence within wi with which you turn your attention inward you know it's am i really thinking about this how did this day go how did this behavior go how did this go how did this make me feel i think we're so tuned into that we're sensory people sound smells but we're also introspective people that you have to sort of look and see how did i register all of that okay so the change first begins with realizing that we have this amazing ability to look inward and that's been written about for thousands of years that's not fancy and then then there's this concept of emotional regulation so most of the changes I know people are trying to make is about being too reactive, not reacting appropriately, whether that's kicking the game winning, you know, goal or in surgery or with a lover or with an employer, you know, there's all these things. And so in that garden, um, the emotional brain, um, lots of pieces that like, you know, dogs have and puppies have and animals have, I mean, they're, those are the deeper structures. You might have heard of them as limbic structures or the thalamus, hippocampus, amygdala, these sort of things. They're, they're, they're not in the front here. They're, they're deeper set, um, you know, deep to your eyes, you know, up through your nose kind of locations. That they come primed in some ways and they, those thermostats are set and we react to things. That's life. But what happened was that the frontal lobes, the two in the front, they blossomed on top of it like a mushroom and pushed our foreheads forward over thousands of years. And that that garden and the emotional brain, the modern thinking cognitive brain and the emotional brain, they have branches that overlap. They're not separate. It's not like 
little Venn diagram of stuff. No, they're, they're intermeshed. And in some ways, they are partners, and in some ways, they're at war. And that's what you're, the challenge to change is, to, to recognize that the emotional brain leans a little reactive. It runs loose. It's wild. You know, it's, it's reactive. That's what helped you back away from the edge of the cliff. That's what helped you uh, jump away when you saw a snake, right? Quick, reactive was an advantage, an advantage. But then the frontal lobe comes in and now we're living in a world where we don't have as many cliffs and we don't have snakes and predators, yet we're still, we can't neglect that reactive emotional side of ourselves, but it becomes a barrier to change. And so the frontal lobe has to take time and look inward and say, I don't have to have that reaction. I don't have to have those feelings. Did those feelings earn a place in my life? And so there's constant inner, inner dialogue and, and connection you need to have. And will people say, well, it, well, is that possible? Well, it is possible because the second, if you see a plastic snake, you jump once. And then you see the plastic snake again. And you say, wait a second, that's not a real snake. You thought down your emotional reactive self. You changed. When you're chased by somebody, that adrenaline makes you flee or fight uh, or just brace. But when you see somebody with an ax in a movie, you realize the context. You don't just come running out of the movie theater, right? So that's frontal lobe working to tamp down the emotional lobe. That's frontal lobe creating behavioral change. So those are two simple examples but if you can tell yourself not to be fearful, you can also teach yourself not to be reactive under certain conditions. Mm. And I think that's the power of being able to change our behavior, that the ability exists inside of us. Mm. <clears throat> Excuse me. That's unbelievable. People are going to take so much away because we talk about practices, meditation, you know, mm. it, could, you know it could be yoga in Malibu. <laughs> these, these times and periods that we need for introspection. And a lot of the time we need trauma or we need things in our life that so the important thing about yoga and you know in malibu is it's not the place or the environment it's what you're thinking and you can have that inward directed emotion and thought happen in a prison cell where you don't belong there you've been there um you know without it for a crime you didn't commit like what is a transformation that people in prison go through and they're there for 20 years, how do they find peace? How do they find their mindfulness and creativity? I mean, and clarity. So there's that dimension. There are people who are in a subway and have a, a, a reflective moment. There are people who are on a yoga mat in Malibu and may or may not have that moment. But what I want people to know is it's, it's not something you have to pay for. You know, you, it, originally it was done with somebody who left wealth um, and sat under a tree. So that introspection, that mind work, that how did the day go? If you're paying for it, be careful. Mm -hmm. If somebody's, there's no shortcut for it. It's, it's that energy that you have to turn into yourself. And if certain things facilitate it, fair. If you like looking at trees or you like looking at the ocean, but where I live, the, there is the industry manipulates people by charging them for things that are meant to be free. They're your thoughts. And so that inward direction to change your behavior, to really let emotions earn a place in your mind, that's the ecosystem. That's the garden inside your skull. If you find ways in that, that, that helps you, that um, and if Malibu does that or the beach does that, that's great. But there's no shortcut because somebody in prison might be having that, that, that moment but somebody who's not incarcerated, incarcerated at the beach may not be. Mm -hmm. So it's not a, by, it's not a certain out for a look or a place. Uh, it's, it's actually what's going on in your inner life and inside your skull. And that's a very important point because I live in Los Angeles and I, often we see people who come in, cancer patients as well, that have been manipulated by the industry. That if you do these things, these are anti-inflammatory or these are this. And... Um, the ones that are misguided are always the ones with the money to spend. Hmm. And there you can see the unfair competition taking advantage of people. So that's kind of a side riff. But the point is, no, there's no shortcut to that work. And there's no, there's no, it's never too late for that work. 
and there's no location where that that work is more likely to happen. It's really just that stuff inside your head that nobody knows about. But that's so, so crucial, I think, for people to really grasp that. I think in the modern day, we've lost so many of those opportunities for us to have some introspection, whether that's, well, I think it's largely because we have phones, right? We have, you know, cell phones or mobiles, as we call them over here, like that moment when you're standing in the queue for lunch or you're on transport or whatever it is, and you're just sat with your thoughts. We don't have that anymore because we're constantly distracted by something else. So that's one, but you, it, it, the, the, you know, the origin and the solutions aren't easy. Listen, the mental health issues are going through the roof and we've learned more about the brain than any other time in our lives. So there's this disconnect. We're like becoming tremendous. We have tremendous knowledge about how the brain works. Yet people's minds are less healthy. That's the conundrum. That's the challenge here. And that's why I try to get away from hardwired or neuroscience shows or mm. this part, you know, lights up. It just doesn't capture the complexity of what we're seeing in people. So those shortcuts don't exist, but real change, behavioral change, psychological change can happen if you start to see your brain as a garden that is a dynamic system with chemicals and electricity and unlimited potential and possibility. It's not easy, but it's there. And if you wonder in your dark moments how to do it, just remember the example that many cancer patients have. Hmm. Hmm. What can listeners do to have better brain health? Well, that was the, you know, the first book we really touched on that. And I'll, I'll give that to you. That I can give you as a list. <laughs> you know, you asked hmm. uh, about mental health. There's no list. But brain health, you're talking about the architecture and the substance of the brain. Can you hear that in the back? It's fine. Anything? The editor will cut that out. It should be fine. Got it. Yeah. So just to rewind, um, or is it on the is it on late on the back? Hey, I'm gonna ask my son, Kai. Do you mind shutting the? Um... I'll be right back. All right. So brain health is, is easier to, to give direct advice about mental health. They're linked is your own personal journey. So brain health, first of all, it's flesh, it's white flesh, despite getting 20% of your blood flow, which is just fascinating. We don't have an explanation. The key is it's flesh and needs to be irrigated. So keeping your heart arteries open, we've heard about that. Those same arteries are in your brain. So you got to keep the vessels open so that flesh is irrigated. That means whatever you want to do. Take your cholesterol pills. Don't clog the arteries of your brain because swaths of brain flesh will, will, uh, will wither. So that's important. Heart health, brain health, they're all linked. It's, it's vascular health is what we're talking about. The other thing is um, those that garden, they it shoots electricity and chemicals, right? It's like a a garden, an aquarium filled with electrical eels and jellyfish and stuff like that. And that electricity, as it ricochets around, relies on a certain fat for insulation, much like our coverings of wires. And that's from fatty fish. Hmm. So omega-3, there's actually an, there's a purpose for it. It's not just eat this, eat granola. I mean, I get that. But I think people make change when they understand. So omega-3 is a certain type of fat, the good fat helps protect the insulations of the electrical connections in that garden of your mind. So that comes from fatty fish, or if you're vegan, there's other ways to get around it. Um, so that that's another one. And then the third one is, is that it's a thinking flesh. It's thinking flesh, right? If, if you want to, how, if you, you know, you ask me, how do, how do I like improve my ability to run? Well, if you ask Usain Bolt, he said, just run more. Mm -hmm run harder. You, you wouldn't doubt that. Well, your brain is thinking flesh, 
live more, learn more, turn your attention inward. You can't just you can't just sit, you know, you can't just run and eat well and not think because your brain, when those corners of its mind are not relied upon because you're not challenging yourself with a new language or a new skill or a new way home, it's not, it. it's the process of learning, even if you fail, that really activates those deeper corners of that brain. Mm. So you got to keep it fresh. You got to keep it popping. You got to get out there and live your life. If you get stagnant, the brain will rev down because it's it gets 20% of the blood flow. It doesn't want to waste calories. It's an energy hog. It's a glutton. So, you know, you got to keep the arteries open. You got to have a diet, you know, if, you know, being vegetarian, uh, with supplementing with some some foods that offer you omega-3s, and then you got to, you know, got to put that brain to use. You got to learn. You got to sing. You got to dance. You got to get out of your comfort zone, you know. Otherwise... It, it will close shop on some of those those areas that you aren't using. So you see that in people as, as they age, it's the same advice, same advice for teenagers as it is for 80 year olds. Got to get vertical, keep those arteries open, keep popping, keep learning new stuff, dietary changes. If they do that from 50 to 80, they have a lot less dementia than if they don't. So that's the last, you know, not the last, but another important thing, it's glacial. Those are changes you make in your life to keep that that amazing structure, um, you know, at peak performance. Mm, Super. So keep moving, eat well. And the third one was stay engaged, stay smart, student, remain the student. Yeah, Yeah. forever. That's so good. I have two more questions and I promise. Yeah, yeah. Back your day. Um, The first one is obviously with everything you've experienced, you, you mentioned earlier about the number of patients of yours who have died and uh, everyone is eventually going to die but not many of us actually consider our death you know i i mm. read a lot about stoics and that's the first time i started the, the mm. stoic philosophy and i started to consider like you know we actually all of us die and some some of us that is the underlying fear in all of us is that we haven't given enough conscious thought to them mm. what, what would your advice be i'm because i'm assuming you have a, a very good relationship with the idea of death so what would your advice be for people around under, under yeah. death I don't know if I have a good relationship with death because I haven't seen it in front of me. Hmm. Uh, I have seen many other people deal with it. And, and again, like what we talked about from before, I don't know, you know, I don't know what, I don't know what, how I'll do at that time. Hmm. I am coming in armed with some resilience. We'll see what I show in those moments. But uh, um, I think Kafka, you know, they, I don't think he was being facetious. He said, what's the meaning of life? And he's just, I think there's a quote. I, I might be wrong. I mean, I can't remember because I just, I pour a lot of different things in my mind, you know. But he said, the meaning of life is that it ends. And um, hmm. that's the cancer patients have shown me. They do live differently when that finish line comes into view. Hmm. Even those where they end up getting cured of cancer and they have a curable type of cancer, not necessarily the ones I take care of. Whew, hearing that C word, they're different afterwards. I had a patient, constant worrier. He's like, nah, he just completely, completely like certain uh, mental health issues or personality traits went away. He's like, no, man, I was diagnosed with cancer and I beat it or I'm working through it or whatever. Um, and then there are others who who realize that that each day, you know, sort of lived optimally. Planning for the future, but living the day optimally. So they, a lot of them find a, a combination of a physical task and a thinking task. Mm. I had a patient who's a bus driver. She just, she's, that's when I'm, that's when I'm at my best. I'm, th- I'm thinking about cancer, I'm thinking about life, but I'm still driving the bus. LA bus driver. So people find their own way. Um, but, um, you know, I think that's the meaning of life is that it ends. And then that changes the way you, you live the, the days we have hmm. that we've been afforded. Yeah, it's so good. Last one, I promise. So hmm. I said I got so much out of reading your book and I found it fascinating, your experience as a, as a child when it was, it, was a, it was a plane crash, right? Into a building right, hmm. right near where you were. So Two planes overhead. Hmm. Yeah. So the question is, is what you do today you know, both from a science point of view in the labs and what you do on, on the surgery table, is that your is that your purpose? Is that your dharma? Is that what you feel like you were meant to do while you were here? Or was it 
a cert- certain events and things that happened in your life which led you down this path to want to help people and, and change the world? Well, that's, that's a good question, you know. I think I would not be, you know, it wouldn't be forthright if I didn't say I'm not sure. Mm. So, of course, all those things have ha- have shaped that garden in my mind. Um, but helping people and doing it in a competitive fashion, meaning doing something rigorous, highly technical, I think it's, it's this concept of sublimation where, again, it's a chemistry term where you could change from g- gas and different states um gas solid liquid you could skip steps you know it comes from a chemistry term but in the psychological sense it's taking pathological tendencies and putting them to use so what what i what i found was of course all my experiences affected me but mr jet's quote i know you'll do well but i hope you do good was a was a compass for me that things you choose to do will shape the man you become but at the same time, I had a certain intensity, like athletes, you know, um, that I wanted to be good at something. I wanted to compete. And being a cancer surgeon lets me do all of those things in a, in a, in, in a way that I feel good about myself and that I'm trying to help the world. But I can also release uh, all those things inside me that I know if I had let them go into a different direction, they might have been destructive. Mm. So steering that energy, not always changing it, but putting it to use, positive use. I think that's been my, um, that's been my intention and, and I'm trying to make it my, um, my life journey. You know, the word is sublimation. It's a good one to look up, mm-hmm. taking something, taking something in you that could be bad and you know, it could be and harnessing that and putting it to good mm-hmm. use. It's amazing. Sublimation, sublimation. Yeah. S U B L I M A T I O N. Amazing. I mean, you've you've quoted Snoop Dogg, and you know we've had some great. I'm going to quote Harry Potter. <laughs> I'm English. <laughs> I have to. It's when uh, um, he says that we we all have both light and dark inside of us, yeah. it's which you choose to go with. Um, and that's yeah. I, I I didn't watch any of those. Don't get mad, UK. <laughs> um, and also, we both we all have that, and it's contextual there's a darkness in us that we may not know exists until we're faced with a certain adversity or decision or choice until we're tested. Um, and there's a light in us Mm -hmm. that adversity can reveal as well. Mm -hmm. I've seen both in my cancer patients. It's funny. I was literally just reading the poem today. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. Yeah, that's perfect, man. We wrap it right there. Mm. Raul, powerful beyond measure it's been a, such an absolute pleasure honestly i've i've thoroughly thoroughly enjoyed it i'm so sorry i've taken so much of your time i don't normally go that long but um believe it or not i still have millions of questions to ask you but that's been unbelievable Thanks, man thank you so much yeah um, no, it's good vibe good jam good to hear about your baby your life yeah. you know it's all love man we, we take it positive direction yeah thank you mate and um look, for everyone listening this is genuinely one of the best books I've ever, ever read. And I don't say that lightly, like I've probably done about 400 books in the last six, seven years. And this is one of the best books that I've read. Um, so I can't recommend it highly enough. The first one was a, a bestseller over here, Sunday Times bestseller. Um, and I, I wish you all the success with this one as well, mate. I'm sure it's gonna be the same. So thanks again. My pleasure. We'll catch up soon next year, maybe when I'm in London in physical would love that would love that man yeah we um i do a lot of uh, live events you're welcome to any of them i'd love to have you come and speak or or just be a part of anything and yeah anything i can do to support what you're doing as well mate i'd love to It'd be a pleasure yeah it's good man good vibe so all right until next time thank you so much